Hello and welcome to Views on News. I am Jawad Tihami. According to the data by Pakistan Bureau of Statistics, Pakistan's consumer price inflation has slowed to 17.3% in April, the lowest reading in the last two years. Inflation touched a figure of 38%. We talk about specifically in May 2023. Also, the overall economic indicators as per uh, the monthly economic update and outlook by the finance division have improved. And uh, this particular report says, let me quote an excerpt from it, the economic growth is showing signs of recovery while inflation is trending down. Both fiscal and external sectors have demonstrated resilience. The market confidence is also a beat. Unquote. Also, in another major development, we have seen IF, IMF Executive Board has approved the immediate disbursement of the last tranche of standby arrangement for Pakistan. That is $1.1 billion. The Deputy Managing Director and the Chair of, uh, chair of the IMF uh, has made a statement. Let me quote that. Pakistan's determined policy efforts under the 2023 standby arrangement have brought progress in restoring economic stability. Moderate growth rate returned, external pressures have eased, and while still elevated, inflation has begun to decline. Given the significant challenges ahead, Pakistan should capitalize on this hard-won stability, preserving beyond the current arrangement with sound macroeconomic policies and structure reforms to create stronger, inclusive, and sustainable growth. Continued external support will also be critical. Unquote. Uh, we have also uh, seen that uh, Pakistan's authorities have uh, recently shown a keen interest in getting a longer and a larger new program with the International Monetary Fund. And it is expected that IMF mission might be visiting Pakistan in the mid of May to talk about the framework of the new agreement with the International Monetary Fund of the Pakistani authorities. All these matters are for discussion in today's Views on News. For that, we are honored to have been joined in the studio by Professor Dr. Mohammed Naveed. He is global finance expert and former dean of the Management Sciences at Yale University and professor of finance. Uh, Dr. Naveed, thank you very much for your time, for being with us on the show tonight. We really appreciate that. Also in the studio, we are honored to have been joined by Dr. Nasir Iqbal. He is head at the Macro Policy Lab at Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. Dr. Iqbal, thank you very much for your thank time. You. Also for being with us on the show tonight, we really appreciate that. Also in the studio, we are honored to have been joined by Mr. Mehtab Heather. He is senior journalist. Mr. Heather, thank you very much for thank your you. time. Also for being with us on the show tonight, really appreciate that. Let me begin the discussion with you, Dr. Naveed. Let's talk about this uh, slowing trend of inflation. Now, this is a considerable re reduction as far as when we talk about a year before, specifically back in May 2023, it touched a figure of 38%. Uh, and now it is 17.3%. What core reasons do you as associate with this considerable reduction? Uh, the very first, I would say, uh, it's, a turn, uh, it's a turn around uh, that we have that we foresee for the economy right now. Uh, looking into uh, the economic uh, recession time when the inflation was uh, high and directly and indirectly affecting the, the economic eye and uh, the economic parity of the, the population, I would say. Uh, let me appreciate uh, sheer contribution on the part of the government and uh, with a very mainstream agenda, I would say. Uh, inflation, uh, that is uh, one of your, basically, the purchasing parity, I would say. Uh, what the government they have taken? Uh, they have taken, uh, I would say, very stern measures. The strong measures they have taken, uh, that is the robustness of the, the implementation of the, the guidelines th they have in that standby agreements, that is with the, with the, uh, the IMF. So the deviation is not there. So this is the first point that we have taken. The second was, uh, if you need to bring your eyes towards what's happening uh, prior election and uh, that a very uh, anticipated, I would say, uh, default it was uh, we are expecting on the part of the sovereign default of the country that we have so what we need we need to engage a stakeholders approach so government has taken very strong measures on the one side they have uh, up to certain extent they're very successful towards the harmony it's the economic harmony that was there and second it was the engagement or uh, the mobility of the economic activity that is coming in the mainstream so coming with the mainstream agenda in line with the all those robust measures that is being in line with the, the guidelines of the imf and second, I would say uh, that is the economic agenda of the government as well. 
from the day one uh, the economic development eye of the government that is bringing it to, uh, to the point that how we have to bring uh, the positive outlook of the economy. So I think the consistency of the policy I have to place at the first place. The second I need to find out uh, the robust measures uh, that is uh, having some uh, fiscal space. So this fiscal space I would say it brings some flexibility. If you want to see the world financial order what we are experiencing in the, in the entire world today. Uh, that is more towards on the one side how you have to bring a flexibility in the business models, how you need to bring a flexibility in the governance and how you need to bring a flexibility in the financial policies but with the integration. When you integrate your economic and financial inclusiveness and you have a watch on some a mainstream agenda, so in the long run you need to find out it's going to have the impact. If I give, I give a very quick eye, uh, you can see uh, the positive outlook of the economy that we are experiencing today in terms of what's happening with the stock exchange. It's capitalized, uh, you need to find out the economic hallmark. It has across 70,000 points. What's the reason behind uh, the confidence that has been more injected? So we need to find out this confidence, uh, more economic activity and end of the day, it's going to give on the one side economic inclusion, but on the other side, we need to find some economic flexibility that is for the economic users. So I think uh, this uh, mainstream agenda, it need to have a very sustainable approach. Uh, in the, uh, the very uh, starting what you said, uh, the confidence that we receive from the IMF, uh, this is the international, uh, the lending institutions, uh, the senior board meeting. They are declare Pakistan as a stabilized economy, but they are expecting more. Pakistan is a stabilized economy, but we need to come up with a sustainable growth and with the economic inclusion. So I think it's another uh, aspect. So that's why the confidence of the government is more that we have to look into a long term uh, financial agreements uh, with the IMF where we have to complete the reforms that is in the long run bringing more economic and financial inclusiveness for the, the economy. Uh, right, uh, Dr. Nasir Iqbal, when you talk about this reduction in inflation, what's your understanding how this particular uh, reduction happened? What core reasons do you associate with that? Uh, do you associate with that uh, particular growth that has been posted as far as that outcome from the agriculture sector as per this monthly economic update and outlook is concerned also? And thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to explain. You know, when we talk about the, this decline in inflation, it was natural in the sense that we, we observed a very high inflation last year and of course, when the base is very high, the next trend would be on the on the lower side. But but it again is a have a some sort of positive indication for us mm -hmm. when we are looking ahead. Mm -hmm. On the growth side, as you already mentioned, that there are some indication that probably there is a maybe it's not a V-shaped recovery, but still we are hoping uh, uh, some sort of a decent recovery in this year, uh, ranging from like last year we observed a negative growth rate, but probably this time we are hoping like 2 to 2.5 as a as a growth rate the one contributor as you mentioned is the is the uh, is the agriculture sector but on the other side the last year's negative growth would be an indication that that would give us some leverage that definitely we we have to grow so these are the two factors that that link with this reversal and of course th there are some other good news that complement these all kind of uh, economic activity one as Dr. Sir mentioned that the, the stock exchange, that could be a one indication where you can observe some sort of a business activity. But on the other end, this uh, IMF package that we recently concluded and uh, the government uh, interest to go for a longer term arrangement with the IMF, that gives some leverage to, to the financial sector and the, the business. So these all factor basically pushes toward the, the recovery path. But to what extent these are sustainable whether they will be able to meet our future need. Do this uh, incline or the, the stakeholder or the decision maker to start implementing reforms because ultimately the way forward and the sustainable path for us is to go for reform. Yes. Are we really ready uh, to go for that hard decision? If not, then these short term recoveries would probably be be a wastage of another year or so on right, if uh, we didn't go uh, far. Dr. Dr. Iqbal, I, I see your partner for holding you over here for just a second. Uh, I would like to take your detailed view, uh, view regarding the implementation reforms in order to get the sustained dividend out of these hard decisions which have been earlier made by the Pakistani authorities. Now, uh, specifically talking about the reduction uh, in CPI, uh, 
uh, in the last couple of months, we have seen a gradual decrease in that one happening now. Uh, on the other side, the, the policy rate, uh, uh, the monetary uh, uh, policy rate that has been kept consistent for the seventh consecutive meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee uh, meeting. What do you think, why has that been kept at the very same level? Yeah. You know, I think uh, uh, like there are uh, different views regarding the, the policy rate. One school of thought believe that it should be retained at the same position to, to create a certainty in the system. So it is too early to, to start reducing that, uh, that discounted because the, the return in, in shape of inflation is, is, is still a premature. We can't say that. But it already lower. produced results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, in the reduction yeah. of inflation already, it's not. We can't like 100% claim that this is coming from the from the discounted because when we looking into the the nexus between or the relation between the discounted and inflation, our study show a bit different result. Like we we claim that it it even hard through the the cost channels. So the, you know that it's increase your cost of borrowing. It also hurt the business activities when the discount rate is relatively high. Currently, it's 22. It's uh, relatively high. But on the other hand, when we talk about the real return, so inflation is, if the inflation is more than 20, 25 percent, 30 percent, then the dis discount rate would at least it still is uh, on the negative side if we talk about the real side. So this is like a gamble between the, the both side. On the uh, state bank believe that the, uh, this will help to reduce inflation. But on the other side, it will increase the cost of uh, borrowing as well. So it is like uh, some sort of trade-up between these two, R two uh, costs. Regarding this particular uh, aspect, there has been a statement by uh, the uh, Deputy Managing Director of the IMF that the State Bank of Pakistan's tight monetary policy stance mm -hmm. remains appropriate until inflation returns to more moderate levels. Now, this more moderate levels, what are those more moderate levels coming below uh, double digits going into the single digit or even it remains somewhere in the double digit that would be also considered as a moderate level. You know, I, w w uh, I did a study on to find the threshold level of inflation that we feel is a good for our economy. It's around seven, six to seven percent. Mm -hmm. So if we really talk about the conducive inflation rate, it should be around six to seven percent. So beyond that would definitely, would definitely have a, a negative implication. But uh, you know, the uh, the IMF always believed that that there is, is th their narrative is that the strong or the tight monetary policy would help mm -hmm. to curtail some sort of demand side of the economy. Though it hurt a growth, like the the last year negative growth and this year only two percent growth rate. Still, it's below the uh, the population growth rate. We can't say this is a positive growth, but uh, of course, it's on the positive side. So I am a believe that that the tight monetary policy would help to to have a two two positive side. One to curtail the domestic consumption. Mm -hmm. to, second, it will help to manage some sort of import export differences in terms of uh, reducing the demand for the imported uh, goods. So right. these are the, the, uh, right. let, the me, let me quickly go towards uh, Mr. Heather. Mr. Heather, your understanding regarding as to the reduction in this particular trajectory of inflation and where do you think the moderate levels would be where this monetary policy rate would be most uh, possibly be uh, revised? Uh, Bismillah rahman rahim thank you very much. Actually, you know, Pakistan's economy is known as boom bus cycle. For instance, last year uh, there was a negative growth. Now we expect that the growth level be, will be around 2% of GDP. There are different projections, 2 to 2.5% 2 to, uh, 2 at the government. <coughs> official projections is 3.5%. The problem is that the growth level is not sustainable. Hmm. And if you come to discuss the inflation side, hmm. there are three major factors. One is uh, international prices of oil and commodities. It would have a major impact. And recently, we have seen, except from uh, this uh, conflict areas, there are some kind of ease down. And we expect that it will be translated in case of Pakistan. And second is the uh, forex ex uh, exchange rate stability had impacted positively in case of Pakistan. Uh, when we come to, to inflation and CPI based inflation basically, uh, there is another factor and that is the base effect. Because of the higher base, 
we we analyze that uh, there is a, a positive reduction in it. Now come to your point. Actually, uh, there is no justification to keep uh, monetary stance tighten or constant at the level of 22 percent because uh, there is a positive interest rate. And if we compare it with the core inflation, there is a much wider gap. So, it is nothing else but the dictation of the IMF. And uh, basically, there is a one problem and that problem is on the fiscal side. If we analyze the fiscal side, there are some challenges. For instance, in last nine months, uh, there is a, a overall there is a fiscal deficit, but there is a primary balance positive. Yes. And it is around 1.6 trillion, uh, around 600 billion. So, that target is uh, we have achieved and keeping in view the IMF program, but our overall fiscal side there is a problem and the major problem is on account of the debt servicing mm -hmm. and the debt servicing will not decrease until and unless there is need to reduce the discount rate and or the policy rate. So, it is a vicious cycle. We, our economy has plunged into it. Our growth is not sufficient because our population growth is 2.6 percent and if we achieve 2 percent, it is less than uh, our population growth. So, in dollar per capita, our economy is not going to increase up to the that, that level. So, these are the challenges and the next IMF program that would be the major challenge because IMF pre prescription is one shoe fits for all, tight fiscal and tight monetary policy. So, it is a big challenge for our policy makers how we negotiate a program in a staggering manner which does not actually burden the middle class or the lower middle class more. That would be the major okay, challenge. So what, keeping well, as per your understanding, uh, a very comprehensive view of the uh, uh, the problems that actually underlie uh, you have given. Now, the broader contours of that new IMF program with Pakistani authorities. What do you suggest about it? Actually, that you could know, actually put a less least burden on the common man, as you have mentioned. There is a need because we are seeking three to four years program. Mm -hmm. It should be staggered. There is a trust deficit. IMF wants that the program should be front loaded. Front loaded means that the maximum conditionalities must be materialized in within one and a half year period of the program. Okay. But our authorities, they, but they, they should have, first of all, they should have a homegrown program of reforms of next three to four years. Instead of IMF uh, should not dictate us what should be the design of the program. So, the design of the program is the most critical thing for the next three to four years. And let me uh, allow to say this, it should not be designed in a manner which was designed by earlier regime during the PTI led regime when the design of the program was flawed and because of that design. And then uh, there was uh, COVID. So, it increased or multiplied our uh, financial and economic woes. So, the most critical thing is the best design of the program. And we have economists in Pakistan, for instance, PIDE, for instance, other uh, think tank. There is a need to build the capacity within the Ministry of Finance, right. FBR, and State Bank of Pakistan, so that we should prepare a homegrown strategy for the next three to four years and then we should discuss it Pretty with Pretty much IMF. understandable. Uh, Mr. Heather, I will take uh, this point to the other two participants also, but uh, I want you to shed a little bit of light. How crucial is to stay with the IMF for another program in order to get the stability towards uh, sustainable economic recovery? I think there is no other option. We will have to go to the IMF, but what I am trying to say that there is no other option, but the design of the IMF program should be done in a staggered manner. For instance, staggered manner means we will have to increase the taxation. What should be the strategy in taxation? 
it should be rather than increasing the tax rates, we should go for uh, broadening of the tax base. There is a need to digitize the FBR, mm -hmm. but how we should digitize the FBR? There is one element is the data, but the second element is how to utilize the data and how we convert the data into taxability. These are the major challenges and devil lies in details. So we will have to uh, develop a device, a program on which there should be uh, ownership of the political side as well as our policy makers so that this program should be designed as, as a Pakistan program instead of IMF should dictate it and we should implement it. Uh, and as well as on expenditure side, there is a need of pension reforms. Mm -hmm. There is a need uh, to reduce uh, the mon monetary stance because it will help us to curtail the current expenditures mm -hmm. which is mounting. Uh, right. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Naveed, what's your understanding when we talk about the importance of a new, longer and a larger IMF program, keeping in view the kind of statements which give us a kind of um, optimism regarding as, as and when the negotiations between Pakistani authorities and the IMF mission, which is likely to be here uh, in mid of May, uh, are going to be on a positive trajectory given the track record of the performance of the authorities mm -hmm. under the mm -hmm. SPA. Firstly, how crucial is the new, larger, longer IMF program and what could be the broader contours? Do you agree with very important points that have been raised by Mr. Hathar? Uh, I think the anchoring point that we have taken, uh, you have no other option left right now. Uh, you have to bring your political harmony uh, along with the ownership that, that is more important. Okay, now uh, this, the politic, uh, this, the financial arrangements that we have uh, with the IMF uh, from a longer perspective, uh, it brings uh, your economy uh, very close to the glands where you need to find out whether you are taking it as a dividend, whether you are adding more liability. If we have this realization, yes, it would be a turnaround opportunity. We have to uh, bring a dividend. Mm -hmm. So this fiscal spacing uh, definitely uh, that is uh, directly associated with the, with the reforms. So I would definitely uh, highly acknowledge uh, to my the co-panelists uh, we have to definitely uh, take the reforms. So this is, uh, I would say, one, one of the, uh, the critical turnaround uh, reforms uh, opportunity, I would say, that we have. Okay, f uh, what we are lacking, uh, if you bring your uh, the eyes on the recent past, uh, the IMF, that is having all those robust measures that is also being uh, directed by the, the FATF as well. Uh, st still, Pakistan is largely undocumented. It's a shadow economy. So you need to find out how the capitalization is taking place. Uh, my eyes still that is coming towards agriculture sector. Pakistan uh, has taken a new name, unfortunately. It's a debt-based economy. It needs to be agri-based economy that is more documented. So in this way, if we can take these reforms, where we need to have uh, through agri-business reforms, we need to have uh, more automation in the, in the agri-system that we have. Even we can uh, give a thought of the, the venture capital models that is more uh, the need of the time. We need to develop agri-business incubation centers as well. So idea would be on the one side we are lacking inclusiveness, but at the same time we have to uh, broaden the tax, uh, the horizon of the country as well. So it's a need of the hour. Okay, second I would say uh, it's more important that is towards the private equity. Okay, now I'm uh, using a term, uh, if I want to see the Pakistan holistically, what is AUM of Pakistan, assets under management of Pakistan, whether it's a, pr a private equity, whether it's, the, it's a, the public equity. For me, the Pakistan is more capitalized through private equity. Unfortunately, this private equity that is more injected in your real estate. A real estate, we need to develop real estate investment trust. The real estate should be largely the part of your capital markets. So we need to bring economic and financial inclusiveness. For me, uh, what is the best investment in Pakistan? The best investment on land is land. If this is a way to, to bring the reforms, so believe me, then we are not going to have the all these robust measures. So we have to develop more real estate investment trust. We have to convert this private equity, whether it's taking the form of your agri uh, business, whether it's uh, taking the form of your real estate, you have to uh, broadening the scope of your capital markets. I was just looking into uh, the figures that we have from 2017, Pakistan Stock Exchange, how much it's capitalized, believe me, the capitalization value of Pakistan in 2017, that, that was $100 billion. And what you see, the current stats we have, although we have economic hallmarks uh, in terms of the points that we have, uh, Economically, There's we have been scored. a considerable uh, increase of 65.7 percent uh, from uh, the, the same period last year. Yeah, we, we crossed 70,000 points. Yeah. 
but on the other side you need to find out what is the, the volume of capitalization Pakistan stock exchange today is capitalized merely with the amount of 21 billion US dollars it's a period it means we are depletion over the period of time okay now what the facts and figures we need to bring capital markets it needs to have a radical reforms I would say it need to have a recapitalization entirely in terms of number of companies are listed it's a huge uh, populous uh, country that is more uh, business driven I would say uh, 500 plus company that is listed on the stock exchange in terms of number of participants uh, it's about 250,000 participants we have uh, for the person st uh, stock exchange so it brings a very very I would say stun Myers yes it's a time uh, bring economic uh, uh, political harmony bring these financial reforms these reforms they are going to bring you that is towards that turn around if Pakistan stock exchange it need to be synchronized as well my Pakistan stock exchange it need to be synchronized with my IMF understanding then my Pakistan stock exchange it need to be synch synchronized with the, the banking industry uh, we are working in silos I would say Pakistan stock exchange is not having uh, the scope of the integration uh, we speak high about the sustainability where is the integration of the sustainability you have to bring your stock exchange you have to bring your agri business you have to bring your power sector that is more uh, have the integration of the SDGs sustainable development goals agri sector today that is going uh, to face unfortunately it is a systemic risk that we are experiencing in the agriculture sector today since we don't have the readiness for the sustainability we are not have uh, taken the measures of the uh, sustainability so I think it's an opportunity uh, starting from the reforms and ending towards we have to close the loop if we are not going to close the loop so then believe me uh, it's I would say the waste of another time and another, another opportunity uh, uh, right uh, uh, Dr. Levy the, 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 as per the findings of the IMF okay. the revenue uh, performance of the authorities uh, during the first half of the fiscal year has been uh, the main cause to achieve that sizable uh, primary surplus in this particular economic update and outlook we also see the stats show that overall uh, net federal revenue the performance was good enough the tax collection was better hmm. now when we talk about broadening the tax base it's been one of the conditions under the SPA as well is it expected to be the similar condition when a new program is signed and when we talk about those sectors mm -hmm. what sectors primarily should be coming in the tax net to broaden it further uh, before uh, I bring my voice towards the, uh, the specific sectors uh, I would say uh, the debt serving capacity we need to develop that is coming through organic growth if we have to use uh, another extended uh, the facilities uh, that is uh, for the the service of the debt for me uh, one of the economic pain right now uh, we have to service 24 billion dollars uh, that is a debt service for the for the coming financial year and what is the uh, the foreign reserve that we have right now with the central bank Th that is just uh, that is a period I would and say out of this 24 billion dollars what is the principal amount and what is the uh, interest uh, uh, over it if uh, you can segregate that if we have to bring what close I, uh, it's almost a 70 30 ratio that we have for that so 70 is the interest rate uh, or the principal the, amount 70 that is the principal that we yes have. so now uh, we are adding uh, the interest cost factor is there as well so from that point of view again uh, if we want to bring that our uh, economic and financial navigation uh, we are more intensive I would say uh, the agri uh, culture sector I said earlier mm -hmm. the second uh, I need to find out that is your real estate mm -hmm. so these two sectors they need to be documented we have to take very strong measures okay, so, so when we specifically talk about agriculture uh, ag agriculture sector oh, what challenges are there why can't we get the dividend of broadening the tax and <laughs> getting the revenue from agriculture sector what are the challenges that uh, intrinsically lie there okay uh, for me the first uh, that is uh, the lack of uh, documentation I would say as I uh, said uh, earlier it's a very shadow economy uh, it's more shadow I would say uh, rather what we are expecting so we have to make it more documented uh, one uh, we receive uh, your thought is very important that is towards the digitalization that we have so we have we are living in the, the age of the information we have to bring uh, more towards the, the automation of the automated system uh, that is associated with the, with the agriculture mm -hmm. and second I would say uh, if I want to see uh, the banking eye 95 percent uh, of the, the corporate finance especially that is been for the the corporations mm -hmm. so we have to bring uh, some uh, the financial reforms in the form of some uh, financial assistance we have to provide uh, in the economic and financial inclusiveness of the agriculture sector I would say so documentation is the prime issue 
The second, we have to start some microfinancing that is in the form of the venture capital, whether we think about in the form of some microfinancial institution. They're going to be more sustained. It would, on the one side, it would uh, bring uh, the agriculture sector that is more documented, but at the other side, uh, it would bring economic inclusiveness that would bring some the broadening of the taxation. Uh, uh, right, uh, Dr. Iqbal, uh, your understanding as to what sectors should be brought into the tax net uh, do you also agree it should be started from agriculture and what intrinsic challenges lie there? I think I have a little bit different view regarding the broadening of tax. So the IMF definitely will ask for a more broadening of tax and over the last 17, uh, seven decades we are listening this term that we have to broaden the tax. But we are trying to work at fight that if we live with the existing economy and if we live with the existing framework, how we can increase our tax. So what we did, we did an exercise. If we rationalize the tax rate, rationalization doesn't mean that we have to increase. Actually, we have to reduce the tax rate on so many items where that create uh, like a discourage business activities. If we go for that rationalization, coupled with digitization, so these two elements would help us to even we can from increase our tax revenue from nine trillion to more than thirteen trillion. So for that, there is a need of will from the, the power sector, so, 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 uh, from the government. Uh, for the uh, understanding of the general public, when you talk about reducing the tax rate, yeah. right? how is it uh, <coughs> related to the expansion of the tax base? Let me give you the example. Now. We are like, uh, for example, on the salaried person, we have tax rate for the middle class is 20%, 30%, 40%. And if the corporate rate is high, then the, my personal tax rate, then probably I'll prefer to go as an individual while returning the tax. This discouraged the corporatization. So this gave a one indication we have to rationalize our tax rate. There is a debate that we should reduce this tax rate from 30% to uh, around 25%. Similarly, look at the regulatory duty. Look at the, the other tariff that we are imposing. That will uh, help to increase the smuggling as well as the rent seeking in the system. And even FBR itself admitted that there is a lot of leakages. On the other hand, more than two trillion are as a tax expenditure on the name of exemption. Why we are giving those exemptions? So just remove those exemptions. Of course, there are some, some areas where you have to go for exemption, but what are the other areas? Those can be removed and that will give you a two trillion more revenue. So these are revenues. The other component that is super important and that they never be discussed by the IMF as well as are the policy makers think of the, how we can reduce the size of the government. Mm -hmm. You know, from the very first economic plan back in 1960s, one of the key recommendation was if we have to create a balance, a fiscal balance, the first priority should be to cut the government size. But we didn't do that. In terms of numbers of proportion, in how much considerable impact that is going to have that cut in the size of the government? Let me give you an example. Uh, our estimate, PIDE estimate shows that around the government footprint is 70% of the GDP. So we are running all kind of businesses. We are running so many departments without having any productivity. Why? Around There is a government owned report that shows if we, if they even close 400 departments, at the federal level, there would be no impact on the government working. So they are paying without knowing the output or the function of those institutions. Uh, uh, right. Uh, we are paying subsidy on the name of so many things. We are running well so taken. many businesses. If we really cut down this government size by half and remove the restriction of so the uh, business. There could be a considerable cut in the expenditure, of right? Of course, that uh, would be the only way Let me Mr. Heather also. Can, Mr. can Heather? I add something? Uh, please go ahead. Yes. Actually, you know, when we are in the IMF program, we shouldn't expect that IMF will allow us to reduce the tax rate. Of course, mm -hmm. I, I agree with I you. I disagree with that. You, you uh, that is that exactly what you have written. We should go for the home ground economic plan. If we have uh, any plan, definitely we can convince them. Mr. Heather is also is anticipating a heavy yes. taxation as yes. far as the new program is concerned. Actually, we have seen that it was one of those conditions of broadening the tax base tax when we talk about the SBA. That's also. the easiest path. So actually, the problem is, lies in details. That is the issue. Of course, philosophically and academically, I agree what he is saying. In the medium term, 
it is totally doable. What is more doable is on expenditure front. For instance, uh, in the aftermath of 18th constitutional amendment, we have devolved certain subjects, but why we kept so many ministries and so many departments at the federal level, at least it should be devolved or abolished. Yeah. Of course, uh, uh, there is a need to, uh, to put all the employees into the surplus pool. So these kind of reforms are required. Of course, homegrown program means that we should take bold and tough decision at our own level. There should be an ownership. For instance, we always blame the IMF, but the problem lies with us as well. Civil service reform is the most crucial thing, which we will have to pursue. We will have to appoint right man for the right job. It, there is no IMF in it. The IMF now is not dictating us that why we are not doing it. So just, uh, uh, just one liner I will add. Please. The, the why we fail to cut the government side, the only reason is this bureaucratic structure. Mm. Until unless we go for reforms, I totally agree with the, uh, with the Mehtab's point that the, the civil service reform is the key. Why we kept these ministries over here? Why we kept these departments? Because we have to give a C to a 20 grade secretary. And they claim that if we abolish these, how they, from where they get the, those costs? Mr. Hadley, please But continue. two points more. Without fixing the tax system, there is no solution. And one element is more important, and that would be the uh, major uh, plan of the IMF program, and that is the energy and power sector. We cannot sustain this kind of power sector. It's a cash bleeding power sector. It's, it's allocation of what, what we are spending, it's more than our defense budget. It's unsustainable. So, it is critical to bring reforms, and reforms okay, mean so, uh, we will have to uh, overhaul the overall power sector uh, from generation uh, to distribution and points. to transmission, yeah. everything. Yeah, please go ahead. Then uh, I have to go back quickly to Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Heather. I, I, I was just looking into uh, in terms of the GDP. Uh, what is the revenue? It's it's about nine point two. The revenue. It's the percentage that we have. Uh, now, we have the eye that is towards the expenditures. Uh, it's al almost approximately 13% expenditure that we have. So uh, for me, uh, the, the word that we use for the development projects, uh, I think uh, my concern is more with the planning commission here. Uh, we start with the, the development project with the PC1, and we finally end on the, the PC5, that is the sustainability, and what are the economic benefits uh, that is associated. So I think uh, we need to find out, rather going for the new development projects, there are so many projects they are at the stage of PC4 and PC5. So they need to have a political acceptance. Uh, that is the efforts being there, the project that is at the stage of the deliverance, I would say economic social benefits are associated. Mm -hmm. So what we need, uh, I think we are not having that political flexibility. So uh, I would say we have to uh, keep our uh, political interest that is on uh, very back, I would say. Right. So we need to find out uh, the development projects. They are already in the process. They are ready for the, the dividend, I would say. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, Ms. Ayad, uh, as you already mentioned, uh, the problem with the uh, energy sector, let's uh, specifically talk about that. Uh, now, this particular statement by Deputy uh, Managing Director of the MF, the authorities have stabilized the energy sector circular debt over the course of the SBA through timely tariff adjustments and enhanced collection efforts, right? These two efforts have already been made. There is a suggestion now in the second half of this particular statement. Let me quote that also. Well, these actions need to continue. It is also critical that authorities undertake the cost side reforms mm -hmm. to address the sector's underlying issues and viability. Uh, would yes. you like to make us understand wh what sense does this Actually, particular thing make? Uh, you know, uh, there is no reform to, to raise the tariff. Because <laughs> it means that uh, there is something uh, within, within, the, within the system, there are leakages. I agree that there should be a reform to reduce the cost of power generation. And we will have to, uh, for instance, imported fuel. When the prices of the coal or RLNG or gas RLNG will increase, uh, the tariff will, will have to, to be readjusted in different shapes. So it's, but there is a need to bring reforms. Why we are not appointing a right man for the right job 
uh, the CEOs of the discos and the boards of the discos, it should be a merit. Because uh, when, uh, for instance, uh, I am a journalist. Uh, if uh, I am a journalist and I cannot write a story, so I <laughs> I am not doing my my job properly. So these boards and the uh, the CEOs should must be appointed on merit. And let me allow to say something on power sector. S status quo is not the solution. Uh, now uh, there is no other uh, thing, and I, I, I can easily predict the taxation side and the energy side will be the major thrust area or the mainstay of the next IMF program. Uh, right in your story, you also talked about the pension uh, reforms, also, right? Uh, you already discussed in your earlier take. Could you shed a little bit of more light onto it? What could be the challenges when it comes to making the pension reforms? Is it expected to be one of the new demands because this wasn't in the SBA? Yes, actually, you know, the one thing more on taxation side. We have discussed the federal government, but the problem lies with the provinces. Their contribution in tax to GDP ratio is less than 1%. And under the constitution, they have the major taxes. For instance, GST on services, income tax on agriculture and property. They are not doing what they can do on, on, on pension reforms. In Pakistan, we have three to four generation are enjoying the pensions. So there is a need to bring changes in the rules of the business. Now what could be the possible changes? I mean, the possible changes will be changing in the commutation. We have a summary which was already forwarded during the tenure of the last government. Now the IMF will, will, will pursue it because this kind of pensions, it's unsustainable. It's increasing with the passage of time. And I am, we are talking, the center as well as the provinces. There's a need as to well rationalize. As I remember there was a little bit of uh, uh, change in the policy of the pensions uh, as far as the last budget is concerned. Is that so? Am I correct? Yes, I, there was, there uh, it was announced, but uh, it was not fully implemented. So this time, uh, it would be the major IMF program condition as well as uh, the World Bank, because right. World Bank is also providing us uh, assistance for bringing structural reforms in, into the public sector. Uh, right, uh, Dr. Iqbal, unfortunately, we are short mm -hmm. of time. Your quick take regarding this particular yeah, yeah. problem of the pensions. Yeah, uh, the I did a study on pensions, so we should have to move from the government finance pension system to self contributing pension system. So this would be the way forward. Otherwise, it would be unsustainable and we will not be able to to even meet the, the pension burden in the next 5 to 10 years. Anything that you want to add, Dr. Uh, Nabeeth? I give my the, the financial life from the capital markets. I think uh, w uh, it's a pool of funds that we have in the form of the pensions that we have. Uh, if we start uh, focusing more on the mutual funds, if we start have the eye to, towards see the blue bonds, uh, the green bonds, so I think uh, in this way we can uh, capitalize the pool. Uh, it can be more uh, towards the investment on the one side. But on the other side, we can increase the volume of the pensions and we can uh, the pay uh, to their, uh, I would say, the due, that is, uh, the cutoff point. So I think the pension funds uh, that we have that is in isolation. And across the world, what we have experienced, they have a program for that in the form of the mutual funds, in the form of the security, short term, uh, safe uh, investments are there. So I think we have to channelize the mutual funds, that is with the economic generation of the funds for the, the nation as well. You're right, Professor Dr. Mohammed Naveed, global finance expert and former Dean of the Management Sciences, Berea University, Professor of Finance, thank you very much for your time for being with us on the show tonight. Dr. Nasir Iqbal, head of the Macro Policy Lab, Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, thank you very much for your time also. Mr. Mehtab the senior journalist, thank you very much for your time also for being with us on the show tonight really appreciate that with that we come to the end of today's episode till the next one take good care of yourselves so thank you